in the ever-shifting shadows of an uncertain world, where reality blurs between what is solid and what slips away, unfolds a tale of mystery beyond human grasp. Enter the captivating universe of The Madman by Khalil Gibran, where sanity melds with madness in the fading twilight. Within the enigmatic realm of Orphalese, where secrets whisper through cobblestone streets and hearts beat to the rhythm of the unknown, resides an extraordinary figure, the madman. With his piercing gaze and enigmatic smile, he both intrigues and unsettles those who cross his path. Who is this madman truly? Is he a sage, a visionary, or a mere illusion of the mind? As we delve into the mysteries of his existence, we embark on a mesmerizing journey through the landscapes of the human spirit, where reason and emotion entwine in an eternal dance. From the parlors of the privileged to the hidden corners of the city, we follow the madman's footsteps as he challenges societal norms and unravels cosmic riddles. With each whispered word and cryptic gesture, we plunge deeper into a labyrinth of concealed truths and revelations laid bare. Prepare to immerse yourself in this profound text where ancient wisdom and narrative magic converge to create an unparalleled and unforgettable voyage. Open your mind to the unknown and let the madman guide you through the profound secrets of the human soul. You ask me how I became mad. It happened one day long before the gods were born. I woke from a deep sleep and discovered that all my masks had been stolen. Yes, the seven masks I had myself made and worn in seven different lives. I ran maskless through crowded streets, shouting thieves, cursed thieves. Men and women laughed at me, and seeing me, many people, filled with terror, ran to take refuge in their houses. And when I arrived at the market square, a youth standing on the roof of his house pointed at me and cried out, Look, there goes the madman! I lifted my head to see who was shouting, and for the first time the sun kissed my naked face and my soul was set aflame with love for the sun, and I no longer wished to wear masks. As if in a trance, I cried out, Blessed are the thieves who stole my masks. That's how I became mad, and in my madness, I found freedom and security. The freedom of solitude and the security of not being understood, for those who understand us enslave a part of our being. But don't let my assurance make me too proud. Even the imprisoned thief is not safe from another thief. God, in the days of my most distant antiquity, when the first quivering of speech reached my lips, I climbed Holy Mountain and spoke to God, saying, Lord, I am your slave. You hide your law, and I will obey you forever. But God did not answer me. He passed like a mighty storm. A thousand years later, I climbed Holy Mountain again and spoke to God, saying, Creator, I am your creature. You made me from clay, and I owe you everything that I am. But God did not answer me. He passed like a thousand wings in a hurried flight. A thousand years later, I climbed Holy Mountain again, and I spoke to God, saying, Father, I am your Son. Your pity and your love gave me life, and by love and worship of you I shall inherit your kingdom. But God did not answer me. He passed like the fog that veils distant mountains. And a thousand years later, I climbed Holy Mountain again, and I invoked God again, saying, my God, you are my supreme desire and my fullness. I am your yesterday, and you are my tomorrow. I am your root in the earth, and you are my flower in the sky. Together we will grow in front of the sun. And God leaned towards me and whispered sweet words in my ear, and like the sea that embraces the stream that flows towards it, God kissed me. And when I descended into the plains and valleys, I saw that God was also there. My friend, my friend, I am not what I appear to be. My outer appearance is just a garment that I wear, a carefully crafted garment that protects me from your questions and you from my neglect. The self in me, my friend, dwells in the house of silence and will always remain there, unnoticed, inaccessible. I would not want you to believe what I say or to trust in what I do, for my words are nothing more than your own thoughts turned into sound, and my actions are your own hopes in action. When you say that the wind blows to the east, I say yes, it always blows to the east, for I do not want you to know that my mind does not dwell in the wind, but in the sea. You cannot understand my navigating thoughts, and I care little whether you understand them. I prefer to be alone at sea when it is day for you, my friend, it is night for me. 
Yet even then, I speak of the daylight dancing on the mountains and of the purple shadow that opens in the valley. For you cannot hear the songs of my night, nor see my wings beating against the stars, and I do not care whether you hear or see what happens inside me. I prefer to be alone with the night when you ascend to your sky, I descend to my hell. And even then, you call me through the impassable gulf that separates us, companion, comrade, and I answer you, companion, comrade, because I do not want you to see my hell. The flames would reach you and the smoke would suffocate you, and I love my hell, I love it to the point of not allowing you to visit it. I prefer to be alone in my hell. You love truth, beauty, and justice, and to please you I say it's good, and I pretend to love these things, but deep in my heart I mock your love for these entities. Yet, I do not let you see my laughter. I prefer to laugh alone, my friend. You are good, discreet and sensible, in fact you are perfect, and in turn I speak to you with reason and discretion, but I am mad, only I mask my madness. I prefer to be mad alone, my friend. You are not my friend, but how can I make you understand? My path is not yours, yet we walk together hand in hand. The old scarecrow must be tired of standing still in this lonely field, I said one day to a scarecrow. The joy of scaring is deep and lasting. It never bores me, he told me after a minute's thought. I said to him, that's true, for I too have known this joy. Only those filled with straw can know it, he told me then. Then I walked away from the scarecrow, unsure if he had complimented or belittled me. A year passed, during which the scarecrow turned into a philosopher, and when I passed by him again, I saw that two crows had nested under his hat. In my hometown lived a woman and her daughters, sleepwalkers. One night, as silence enveloped the world, the woman and her daughter walked in their sleep until they found themselves in the mist-covered garden. Finally, the mother spoke. I can finally tell you, my enemy. You who destroyed my youth and who lived building your life in the ruins of mine, I want to kill you. Then the daughter spoke thus, Odious, selfish, and old woman, you stand between me and my greater self. You would have my life echo yours, faded. You would have me dead. At that moment, the rooster crowed and the two women woke up. The wise dog. One day a wise dog passed by a group of cats. Seeing that the cats seemed absorbed in talking among themselves and did not notice his presence, he stopped to listen to what they were saying. Then a large cat stood up, serious and thoughtful, and said to his companions, Let us pray, and when we have prayed once and again, and again without doubt, mice will fall from the sky. Upon hearing this, the dog laughed inwardly and walked away from the cat, saying, Blind and foolish cats, it is not written, and I have never known, nor my parents before me, that what falls when we raise supplications and prayers to heaven are bones and not mice. The Two Hermits On a distant mountain lived two hermits who worshipped God and loved each other. The two hermits owned a clay bowl, their only possession. One day, an evil spirit entered the heart of the older hermit, who went to see the younger one. We have lived together for a long time, he said. It is time for us to part. Let us divide our belongings. Upon hearing this, the younger hermit was saddened. My brother, he said, I am sorry that you must leave me, but if you must go, so be it. He then took the clay bowl and gave it to his companion, saying, We cannot divide it, my brother, let it be yours. I will not accept your charity, replied the other. I will take only what is mine, we must share it. The younger reasoned, If we break the bowl, what good will it do to you or to me? If you wish, I propose that we cast lots. But the hermit persisted in his will. I will take only what is rightfully mine, and I will not entrust the bowl or my rights to chance. The bowl must be shared. The younger hermit, seeing there was no reasoning, said, Very well, if that is your wish, and if you refuse to accept the bowl, let us break it and share it. Then the face of the older hermit turned pale with anger, and he shouted, A cursed coward! You dare not fight, huh? Of giving and receiving. There was once a man who owned a valley full of needles, and one day the mother of Jesus approached this man and said to him, My friend, my son's tunic is torn, and I must repair it before he leaves for the temple. Will you give me one of your needles? 
But instead of giving her the needle, this man delivered a learned discourse on giving and receiving so that Mary could repeat it to her son before he left for the temple. In the quietest hour of the night, while I lay there drowsy and half asleep, my seven egos sat in a circle speaking softly, saying, First ego, I have lived here in this man all these years, and all I have done is renew his sorrows by day and rekindle his sadness by night. I can no longer bear my fate. Second ego, brother, your fate is better than mine, for I have been given to be this man's joyful ego. I laugh when he is happy and sing his hours of joy. Third ego, what about me? The ego stung by love, the flaming torch of wild passion and fantastic desires. It is the lovesick ego that must rebel against this madman. Fourth ego, the most miserable of us all, that is me, for I have only been given to hate and desire destruction. I am the tormented ego, born in the dark caves of hell. I am the one who has the most reason to protest against this troubled man. Fifth ego, no, it is I, the thinking ego, the ego of imagination, the one who suffers from hunger and thirst, condemned to wander endlessly in search of the unknown and the created. It is I, and not you, who have the most reason to rebel. Sixth ego, and I, the working ego, the burdened laborer, the one who with patient hands and eager gaze shapes days into images, giving formless elements new and eternal contours. It is I, the solitary one, who has the most reason to rebel against this troubled man. Seventh ego, why do you all rebel against this man, when each of you has a preordained mission? How I would like to be one of you, an ego with purpose and a fixed destiny, but I do not have one. I am the ego who does nothing, who sits in the mute and empty space which is not space, and in the time that is not time. While you struggle to enjoy life, tell me, neighbors, who should rebel? Once during the night there was a feast at the palace and a man knelt before the prince. All the guests observed the newcomer and saw that he was missing an eye and that his empty socket was bleeding. The prince asked this man what had happened to him. O oh, prince, replied the man, my profession is that of a thief, and tonight as there was no moon, I went to rob the money changer's shop. But as I climbed and entered through the window, I made a mistake and entered the weaver's shop. In the darkness I stumbled over the weaver's loom and lost an eye. Now, O oh prince, I plead for justice against the weaver. The prince sent for the weaver, and when he arrived at the palace, the ruler decreed that one of his eyes be taken. O oh prince, said the weaver, the decree is just. I do not complain that my eye was taken from me. However, I needed both eyes to see both sides of the fabric I weave. But I have a neighbor, a cobbler, who has both eyes in good condition and does not need both eyes in his work. So the prince sent for the cobbler, and one of his eyes was taken. Thus justice was served. At dawn a fox looked at its shadow and said to itself, Today I will have lunch with a camel. It spent the entire morning searching for camels, but by noon it looked at its shadow again and said, Well, I will settle for a mouse. Once upon a time in the distant city of Widani, there was a king who ruled his subjects with as much power as wisdom, and they feared him for his power and loved him for his wisdom. There was also at the heart of this city a well of fresh clear water from which all the inhabitants, including the king and his court, drank, for it was the only well in the city. One night, while all was calm, a witch entered the city and poured seven drops of a mysterious liquid into the well while saying, From this moment, whoever drinks this water will become mad. The next morning, all the inhabitants of the kingdom, except the king and his chief chamberlain, drank from the well and became mad, as the witch had foretold. That day, in the alleys and marketplaces, people whispered, The king is mad. Our king and his chief chamberlain have lost their minds. We cannot allow a mad king to rule us. We must depose him. That night, the king ordered a large golden cup to be filled with water from the well, and when it was brought to him, the sovereign drank eagerly and passed the cup to his chief chamberlain for him to drink as well. There was great rejoicing in the distant city, for the king and the chief chamberlain had regained their sanity. Once seated at a tavern table, three men, one of whom was a weaver, the other a carpenter, and the third a gravedigger, expressed their ambition. Today, I sold a fine linen shroud for two gold coins, said the weaver, 
so we should drink all the wine we want. And I, said the carpenter, I sold my best coffin. In addition to wine, bring us a succulent roast. I alone need a grave, said the grave digger, but my master paid me double. Bring us honey cakes too. All that night there was much merriment at the tavern as the three friends frequently requested more wine, meat and cakes, and they were very happy. The tavern keeper rubbed his hands together, smiling at his wife. Since the guests were spending generously as they departed, the three friends from the tavern, the moon already high in the sky, walked joyfully singing and shouting. The tavern keeper and his wife, standing at the tavern door, watched their guests with satisfaction. What gentlemen so generous and joyful, exclaimed the wife. If only they would bring us luck, and if every day were like this, our son would not have to work as a tavern keeper, and should not have to give so much. We could offer him a good education, so that he could become a priest. The new pleasure I invented last night, I was about to test it for the first time, when an angel and a demon hurriedly came to my house. Both met in front of my door and argued about my freshly created pleasure. One of them shouted it was a sin and the other asserted with equal vehemence that it was a virtue. The language in which I spoke was that of the world from which I come. And when I was twenty-one days old, on the day of my baptism, the priest said to my mother, You must be very happy, madam, that your son was born a Christian. I was very surprised to hear that, and I said to the priest, In that case your mother must not be in heaven, she must be very unhappy because you were not born a Christian. But the priest also did not understand my language. Thirty-three years ago, after the death of my mother, my nurse, and the priest, only the seer survived. Yesterday, I saw him near the temple entrance, and while we were discussing, he said to me, I always knew you would be a musician, that you would become a great musician. You were so small when I prophesied your future. I believed him, for now I too have forgotten the language of that other world. Once, while I was living in the heart of a pomegranate, I heard a seed say, One day I will become a tree, and the wind will sing in my branches, and the sun will dance on my leaves. I will be strong and beautiful in all seasons. Then another seed spoke and said, When I was young like you, I thought that too, but now that I can reflect better on all things, I see that my hopes were in vain. So that day I settled in the heart of a quince where the seeds are rare and almost mute. In my father's garden there are two cages. In one is confined a lion that my father's slaves brought back from the desert of Nineveh, and in the other lives a sparrow that does not sing every morning. The sparrow says to the lion, Good morning, fellow prisoner. Three ants found themselves on the nose of a man sleeping in the sun, and after greeting each other in the manner of their own tribe, they began to discuss there. These hills and plains, said the first ant, are the most arid I have ever seen in my life. I searched all day for a grain, but I found none. Neither did I find anything, commented the second ant, although I visited all the shelters. Here, I suppose, is what my people call the sweet mobile earth where nothing grows. My friends, said the third ant, raising its head, we are now on the nose of the supreme ant, the mighty and infinite ant, whose body is so large we cannot see it, whose shadow is so vast we cannot embrace it, and whose voice is so powerful we cannot hear it. And this ant is omnipresent. After the third ant said this, the other two looked at each other and began to laugh. At that moment, the man moved in his sleep and raised his hand to scratch his nose, thereby crushing the three ants. Once, while I was burying one of my egos, the gravedigger approached me to say, among all those who come here to bury their dead egos, you are the only one who is sympathetic to me. You flatter me greatly. I replied, but why do you inspire such sympathy in me? He replied, because everyone comes here crying and leaves crying. Only you arrive laughing and leave laughing. Last night, on the marble steps of the temple, I saw a woman sitting between two men. One cheek of the woman was pale, the other red. I was very young when I was told that in a certain city there were inhabitants living according to the scriptures. I said to myself, I will seek this city and the holiness that is in it. This city was very far from my home. I gathered many provisions for the journey and undertook the path. 
After forty days of walking, I saw the city in the distance, and the next day I entered it. But oh surprise, I saw that all the inhabitants of this city had only one eye and one hand. This astonished me greatly. I wondered why the inhabitants of this holy city had only one eye and one hand. Then I saw that they were also amazed, for they were marvelling that I had two hands and two eyes. As they spoke among themselves about my appearance, I asked them, Is this the holy city where everyone lives according to the scriptures? Yes, this is the holy city, they replied to me. And I added, What calamity has befallen you? What has become of your right eyes and right hands? The whole crowd seemed moved. Come and see for yourself, they said to me. They took me to the temple that was at the heart of the city, and there I saw a multitude of hands and eyes all dry. I asked, My God, what inhumane conqueror committed this cruelty against you? There was a murmur among the inhabitants. One of the elders spoke up and said to me, We did it ourselves. God made us conquerors over the evil within us. He led me to a huge altar. Everyone followed us. The old man showed me an inscription engraved above the altar. I read, If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Then I understood, and I turned to the gathered crowd and cried out, Among you there is neither man nor woman with two eyes and two hands. They replied to me, No, no one, only those who are still too young to read the scriptures and understand their commandment. As I left the temple, I immediately left that holy city, for I was not yet too young, and I knew how to read the scriptures. The good God and the bad God met at the top of the mountain. Hello, brother, said the good God. The bad God did not respond to the greeting. The good God continued, Are you in a bad mood today? Yes, said the bad God, because I am increasingly confused with you. I am called by your name and treated as if I were you, and that displeases me greatly. Well, know also that I have been called by your name, said the good God. With these words the bad God continued on his way, cursing the stupidity of men. Defeat, defeat! My defeat, my loneliness, and my isolation, for me, are worth more than a thousand victories, and are sweeter to my heart than all earthly glory. My defeat, my self-awareness, and my challenge, you have taught me that I am still young and agile, and that I must not be deceived by empty laurels. And in you, I have found the bliss of being alone, and the joy of being rejected and despised. Defeat, my defeat, my flaming sword and my shield, in your eyes, I read that to be enthroned is to be enslaved, and to be understood is to be overturned and to be captured, is to reach one's own maturity and like a ripe fruit to fall and be consumed. Defeat, my defeat, my bold companion. Where will you go, my songs, my cries and my silences, and no one else but you will speak to me of the beating of the wings, of the impetuosity of the seas and mountains that burn in the night, and only you will scale my inclined and rocky soul. Defeat, my defeat, my indomitable immortal courage, you and I will laugh together with the storm, and together we will dig graves for all that dies within us, and we will rise in the sun as a single will, and we will be dangerous. The night and the fool I am like you, O dark and naked night. I walk on the flaming path that overlooks my daytime dreams, and every time my foot touches the earth, an oak emerges. No, you are not like me, O oh fool, because you still look at yourself again and again and see how great the imprint of your steps in the sand is. I am like you, O oh silent and deep night, and in the heart of my solitude lies a goddess in labour, and the being they make of it touches hell. No, you are not like me, O oh fool, because you still tremble before feeling pain, and the song of the abyss terrifies you. I am like you, O oh wild and terrible night, for my ears hear the cries of conquered nations, and the size of forgotten lands. No, you are not like me, O oh fool, because you still consider your little ego as a companion and cannot befriend your monstrous ego. I am like you, O oh cruel and terrible knight, for my chest is illuminated by ships burning at sea, and my lips are moist with the blood of slaughtered warriors. No, you are not like me, O oh fool, 
because you still desire to find your soulmate and have not yet become law unto yourself. I am like you, O joyful and gay knight, for the one who dwells in my shadow is now drunk with fresh wine, and the one who follows me sins joyfully. No, you are not like me, O fool, because your soul is wrapped in the veil of seven folds, and you do not carry in your hand the heart. I am like you, O patient and passionate knight, for in my chest lie buried a thousand dead lovers, wrapped in shrouds of faded kisses. So, fool, you will see yourself as I do. You will think that you are like me. You will resemble me. You will ride the storm like a wild foal, and thus the lightning like a sword. Yes, like you, O knight, like you, I am powerful and great, and my throne rests on mountains of fallen gods, and also before me pass the days to kiss the hem of my robe without daring to look me in the face. You will think that you are like me, you the son of my darkest heart. You will think my untamed thoughts and speak my vast language. Yes, we are twin brothers, O knight, for you reveal space, and I reveal my soul. I have seen faces, a face with a thousand faces, and a face that had only one face as if it were contained in an unchanging mould. I have seen a face whose brilliance could be seen through the ugliness that covered it, and a face whose brilliance I had to brush aside to see how beautiful it was. I have seen an old wrinkled face, and a young face, on which all things were engraved. I know all the faces because I see them through the fabric that my eyes weave, and I look at the reality behind the canvas, the greatest sea, my soul, and I went to bathe in the great sea, and when we reached the beach we started looking for a solitary and hidden place, but as we walked on the beach we saw a man sitting on a grey rock, taking handfuls of salt from a bag and throwing them into the sea. This is the pessimist, said my soul. Let's leave here, for we cannot bathe in the presence of the pessimist. We continued walking until we reached a cove, where we saw standing on a white rock a man holding an ornate chest from which he took sugar to throw into the sea. And this is the optimist, said my soul, he too should not see our naked bodies. We kept walking, and at another place on the beach we saw a man picking up dead fish with his hand and putting them back into the water. We cannot bathe in front of this man either, said my soul, for he is a philanthropist. And we continued on our way. Then we met a man who was tracing the outline of his shadow in the sand. Large waves were coming and erasing the drawing, but this man continued again and again to draw his shadow. And this is the mystic, said my soul. Let us move away from him. We continued walking until in another calm bay we saw another man who was collecting sea foam and pouring it into an alabaster vase. And this is the idealist, said my soul. Under no circumstances should he see our nudity. And we continued walking. Suddenly we heard a voice crying out, This is the sea, the vast and mighty sea. As we approached, we saw a man with his back to the sea, applying a seashell to his ear to hear the murmur of the sea. Let's pass by, said my soul. This is the realist the one who turns his back on all that he cannot embrace with a glance, and settles for a fragment of the whole. And we passed by, and in a place full of bushes between the rocks, a man had buried his head in the sand, and I said to my soul, We can bathe here, for this man cannot see us. No, said my soul, for this one is the deadliest of all men, he is a Puritan. Then a great sadness reflected on my soul's face, and its voice darkened. Let's leave here, she said, for there is no solitary and hidden place where we can bathe. I will not let this wind play with my golden hair, nor this wind caress my naked breast, nor this light uncover my holy nudity. And we left that sea to go seek the crucified sea. I would like to be crucified, I cried out to men. Why should your blood flow on our heads, they replied to me. And I replied, how else could you be exalted except by the crucifixion of fools? and they agreed and crucified me, and the crucifixion extinguished me. And as I hung between heaven and earth, they lifted their heads to look at me, and they were exalted, for they had never lifted their heads before. But as they stood there looking at me, one of them cried out, What are you trying to spy on? And another man cried out, For what cause do you sacrifice yourself? And a third man said, do you think to acquire the glory of the world at this price? And then a fourth man said, Look, he smiles, 
can he forgive himself so much pain? And I replied to them all, saying, Just remember that I smile, I spy on nothing, I do not sacrifice myself, and I do not desire glory, and I have nothing to forgive. I was thirsty, and begged to be given to drink of my blood, for how else could I quench the thirst of a fool but by his own blood? I was mute, and asked to be wounded to have a voice. I was a prisoner in your days and nights, and I sought a door to broader days and nights. And now I'm going away as other crucified ones have done. And do not think that we, the fools, are tired of so many crucifixions, for we must be crucified by ever greater men, between lands ever more vast and skies ever more spacious. The astronomer in the shadow of the temple, my friend and I, we saw a blind man sitting there, alone. Look, said my friend, this is the wisest man on our earth. I parted from my friend and approached the blind man. I greeted him and we talked. Soon after I asked him, Excuse me, since when have you been blind? Since my birth, was his reply. And what path of wisdom do you follow? I asked him. I am an astronomer, replied the blind man. He then placed his hand on his chest and said, Yes, I see all these suns and these moons and these stars. The great desire I sit here between my sister the mountain and my sister the sea, the three of us are one in our solitude, and the love that unites us is deep, strong, and strange. Truly this love is deeper than my sister the sea, stronger than my sister the mountain, and stranger than the oddity of my madness. Eons have passed since the first grey dawn made us visible to each other, and although we have seen the birth, peak, and death of many worlds, we are still fervent and young. We are young and fervent, yet we are alone and no one visits us, and though we are wrapped in an almost complete and unrestricted embrace, we have found no ground. Tell me, what comfort can there be for contained desire and unsatisfied passion? From where will come the flaming God who will warm the bed of my sister the sea, and what torrents will soothe the fire of my sister the mountain, and what woman will seize my heart in the silence of the night? In dreams my sister the sea murmurs the unknown name of the flaming God, and my sister the mountain calls far away for the fresh and distant torrent God, but I do not know to whom to address in my dream. Here I sit between my sister the mountain and my sister the sea. The three of us are one in our solitude, and the love that unites us is truly deep, strong, and strange, said a blade of grass, said a tuft of grass, to a falling autumn leaf. You make so much noise that you scare all my winter dreams. Be of low extraction and miserable abode, said the leaf indignantly. Be morose and without song. You do not live in the high region of the air, and you do not know the sound of song. Then the autumn leaf fell to the earth and fell asleep, and in the spring the leaf woke up again and became a tuft of grass. And when autumn arrived and the tuft of grass began to fall asleep with winter sleep, the autumn leaves swayed in the wind and fell on it, then she said angrily to these autumn leaves, How they make noise and scare all my winter dreams. The eye one day said, Beyond these valleys, I see a mountain wrapped in a blue veil of mist. Is not it magnificent? The ear heard that, and after listening carefully for a moment, But where is this mountain? I do not hear it. Then the hand spoke and said in vain, I try to feel or touch it. I find no mountain. And the nose said, There is no mountain around here, grandfather. Then the eye turned to the other side, and the other senses began to murmur about the strange hallucination of the eye, and they said to each other, Something must be wrong in the eye. The two scholars lived in the old town of Africa, two scholars who hated and despised each other's knowledge, because one denied the existence of gods and the other was a believer. One day they met at the market, and in the midst of their supporters they began to discuss the existence or non-existence of gods, and they separated after hours of passionate debate. That night the unbeliever went to the temple and prostrated himself before the altar, and asked the gods to forgive him for his former impiety, and at the same hour the other scholar, the one who had defended the existence of gods, burned all his sacred books because he had become an unbeliever. When my sadness was born, when my sadness was born, I gave her a thousand cares and watched her with loving tenderness, and my sadness grew like all living beings, strong and beautiful and full of wonderful graces. And my sadness and I loved each other and loved the world around us, because my sadness had a good heart, and mine was also kind when filled with sadness. And when we talked, 
my sadness and I, our days were wings, and our nights were adorned with dreams, because my sadness was eloquent and my tongue was also eloquent with sadness, and when my sadness and I sang together, our neighbours sat by the window to listen to us, because our songs were deep as the sea, and our melodies were imbued with strange memories, and when we walked together, my sadness and I, people looked at us with kind eyes, and whispered with extreme gentleness, and there were also those who envied us, because my sadness was a noble being and I felt proud of my sadness, but my sadness died like all living beings, and I remained alone with my thoughts, and now when I speak, my words resonate heavily in my ears, and when I sing, my neighbours no longer listen to my songs, and when I walk alone in the street, no one looks at me. Alone in dreams I hear sympathetic voices saying, Look there, I know that man whose sadness died, and when my joy was born, and when my joy was born, I carried her in my arms and I climbed with her to the roof of my house to cry out, Come, neighbours, come see, for today my joy is born. Come contemplate this pleasant being who laughs under the sun. But what a great surprise, for none of my neighbours came to contemplate my joy, and every day for seven moons I proclaimed the coming of my joy from the roof of my house. But no one wanted to listen to me, and my joy and I were alone, with no one to visit us, then my joy faded and became ill from boredom. From where will come the flaming God who will warm the bed of my sister the sea, and which torrents will soothe the fire of my sister the mountain? And what woman will seize my heart in the silence of the night? In dreams my sister the sea whispers the unknown name of the flaming God, and my sister the mountain calls afar for the fresh and distant torrent God. But I do not know to whom to address in my dream, here I sit between my sister the mountain and my sister the sea, the three of us are one in our solitude, and the love that unites us is truly deep, strong, and strange. Said a blade of grass, said a tuft of grass to a falling autumn leaf, you make so much noise that you scare all my winter dreams, be of low extraction and miserable abode, said the leaf indignantly, be morose and without song, you do not live in the high region of the air, and you do not know the sound of song. Then the autumn leaf fell to the earth and fell asleep, and in the spring the leaf woke up again and became a tuft of grass. And when autumn arrived and the tuft of grass began to fall asleep with the winter sleep, the autumn leaves swayed in the wind and fell on it. Then she said angrily to these autumn leaves, How they make noise and scare all my winter dreams! The eye one day said, Beyond these valleys, I see a mountain wrapped in a blue veil of mist, isn't it magnificent? The ear heard that, and after listening carefully for a moment, said, But where is this mountain? I do not hear it. Then the hand spoke and said in vain, I try to feel or touch it. I find no mountain. And the nose said, There is no mountain around here, grandfather. Then the eye turned to the other side, and the other senses began to murmur about the strange hallucination of the eye, and they said to each other, Something must be wrong in the eye. The two scholars lived in the old town of Africa, two scholars who hated and despised each other's knowledge because one denied the existence of gods and the other was a believer. One day they met at the market, and in the midst of their supporters they began to discuss the existence or non-existence of gods, and they separated after hours of passionate debate. That night the unbeliever went to the temple and prostrated himself before the altar, and asked the gods to forgive him for his former impiety, and at the same hour the other scholar, the one who had defended the existence of gods, burned all his sacred books because he had become an unbeliever. When my sadness was born, when my sadness was born, I gave her a thousand cares and watched her with loving tenderness, and my sadness grew like all living beings, strong and beautiful and full of wonderful graces, and my sadness and I loved each other and loved the world around us, because my sadness had a good heart, and mine was also kind when filled with sadness, and when we talked, my sadness and I, our days were wings, and our nights were adorned with dreams, because and my sadness was eloquent and my tongue was also eloquent with sadness, and when my sadness and I sang together, our neighbours sat by the window to listen to us, because our songs were deep as the sea, and our melodies were imbued with strange memories, and when we walked together, my sadness and I, people looked at us with kind eyes and whispered with extreme gentleness, 
and there were also those who envied us, because my sadness was a noble being and I felt proud of my sadness. But my sadness died like all living beings, and I remained alone with my thoughts, and now when I speak, my words resonate heavily in my ears, and when I sing, my neighbors no longer listen to my songs, and when I walk alone in the street, no one looks at me. Alone in dreams I hear sympathetic voices saying, Look there, I know that man whose sadness died, and when my joy was born, and when my joy was born I carried her in my arms, and I climbed with her to the roof of my house to cry, Come neighbors, come see, for today my joy is born, come contemplate this pleasant being who laughs under the sun, but what a great surprise, for none of my neighbors came to contemplate my joy, and every day for seven moons I proclaimed the coming of my joy from the roof of my house, but no one wanted to listen to me, and my joy and I were alone, with no one to visit us, then my joy faded and became ill from boredom, for only I enjoyed her beauty, and only my lips kissed hers, wrapped in that passionate embrace where time seemed to freeze, where each moment was an eternity of ecstasy. But then, like a shadow spreading over a garden in bloom, solitude came, insidious, creeping into the crevices of our love, transforming our paradise into a barren desert of despair. The warmth of our embraces dissipated, replaced by the icy cold of isolation, and the soft murmur of our laughter faded, drowned in the oppressive silence of our broken hearts. Each moment once shared in the dazzling light of our love is now overshadowed by the haunting shadow of separation. Our hands, once intertwined in an eternal promise, have parted ways, leaving behind a painful void, an echo of abandonment in the tumult of our tormented thoughts. Every night I feel the chill of empty sheets beside me, a constant reminder of the loneliness that has engulfed me since you left. The walls of our home now echo with silence, where each echo bears the weight of our shared memories, now tinted with sadness and regret. Every corner of this house that was once the stage for our shared happiness now seems to be a poignant reminder of what could have been, of what should have been. The joyful laughter that once filled every room has been stifled by the weight of our disagreements and separations. Every creak of the floor seems to remind me of our heated discussions, our passionate arguments that left behind a chilling cold in the air. The walls, once silent witnesses to our love, now bear witness to our separation, to the distance that has grown between us over time. Even the sunlight filtering through the curtains seems less bright, less warm, as if sharing in our sorrow. Yet despite the heaviness of this silence, a glimmer of hope persists. Perhaps these walls, which have witnessed our ups and downs, may one day witness our reconciliation, our ability to overcome obstacles and rebuild what was broken. Perhaps the silence that now reigns will be replaced by the gentle murmur of our rediscovered laughter, by the soothing sound of our voices united in love and understanding. And even though the path to reconciliation seems long and arduous, I am ready to walk it, to face the challenges with courage and determination, because deep in my heart I know our love is stronger than anything. And until the day our echoes blend again in this house, I will continue to carry with me the memories of our past, keeping the flame of our love alive in the darkness, patiently awaiting the moment when we can finally find peace in our hearts and in our home. The photographs on the walls also seem to weep in silence, capturing moments of past happiness, frozen in time but never forgotten. Each picture tells a story, a chapter of our life together, an epic of shared smiles, knowing looks and tender gestures. But now these moments of joy seem shrouded in a melancholic aura, as if even the photographs themselves feel the loss of what once was. I sometimes find myself gazing at these images with a mix of conflicting emotions, the joy of remembering the happy moments we shared, yet also the piercing pain of realizing that these moments now belong to the past. Each face frozen on paper seems to look at me with a particular intensity, as if they are trying to remind me how real our love was, how deep our connection ran, but even in this pain I find some comfort. These photographs are a testament to our love, to our history, and even though our paths have diverged, they remain precious fragments of our shared past. They are the bridge that connects the present to the past, reminding me that even though you are no longer here physically, 
your imprint on my life is eternal. Perhaps one day, when time has soothed the wounds of our hearts, I will be able to look at these photographs with a tender smile, knowing that our love was real and will remain engraved in our memories forever. And until that day, I will continue to gaze upon them with a mixture of pain and gratitude, grateful for every moment of happiness we shared and seeking peace in the memory of our past love. Every corner of the house seems laden with your absence. Every object evokes painful memories that clutch at my heart. The empty chair at the kitchen table, where you sat sipping your morning coffee, reminds me of how you smiled as you savoured each sip. The familiar scent that still lingers on the sheets instantly transports me to the nights when we nestled together, sharing our dreams and deepest fears. Even the books on the shelf which we read together seem to whisper the stories of our lost love. Every day I struggle to confront these memories that surge like tumultuous waves, threatening to overwhelm me. Sometimes I find myself closing my eyes and reliving those precious moments, desperately holding on to the hope that they will return one day. But reality is relentless, cruelly reminding me that you are no longer here, that these memories are all I have left of you. However, despite the pain that consumes me, I find a kind of solace in these memories. They are a testament to our love, to our shared history. And even though you're gone, these precious moments remain intact, preserved in the recesses of my memory. And perhaps through them, I can find the strength to carry on, to transform the ache of your absence into a celebration of what we had, and to believe in a future where our paths will cross again, where our hearts can finally find peace in each other's embrace. The days stretch on in a dull, endless routine, punctuated only by fleeting moments when I allow myself to dream that you might return. But reality always catches up with me, brutal and unforgiving, bringing me back to this insurmountable solitude that weighs on my shoulders like a burden too heavy to bear. Even the polite smiles of passers-by on the street seem to taunt me, reminding me how alone I am in this anonymous crowd. Yet despite the pain that consumes my heart, I hold on to a flicker of hope, fragile yet persistent. Perhaps one day, the echoes of our laughter will resound again within these walls, and the warmth of your love will once more ignite our darkened lives. Maybe fate in its mercy will grant us a second chance to find the happiness we lost, and until that blessed day, I will continue to navigate through the dark days, carrying with me the memory of our love, patiently awaiting the moment when we can finally reunite, and the pain of absence will dissipate in the brilliant light of our reunion. In the darkness of the night, I revisit the moments when we were together, where each embrace was a refuge, each smile a ray of light in the darkness. But now, these memories are nothing but ghosts haunting my thoughts, cruelly reminding me of what I have lost. I find myself listening to the whispers of the wind, desperately seeking a sign of your presence, a breath of comfort in this suffocating solitude. Yet even amidst the profound depths of this enveloping darkness, hope persists, a fragile yet resilient ember that refuses to be extinguished. Somewhere, amidst the vast expanse of our shared world, destiny may yet weave our paths together once more. Time, with its gentle touch, holds the promise of healing our wounds, allowing us to mend that which was once shattered. I dare to envision a future where our hands will once again find each other, where the warmth of our hearts will be rekindled in the tender embrace of our rediscovered love. Until that auspicious day arrives, I carry the weight of our cherished memories as a beacon through the shadows, nurturing the flame of our love in the quiet anticipation of our eventual reunion. In the quiet moments between dusk and dawn, I find solace in the thought that our journey, though temporarily diverged, remains intertwined by the invisible threads of fate. Each passing day is a testament to the enduring strength of our bond, a testament to the belief that love, despite the trials it may face, perseveres. So I wait with unwavering patience, holding on to the belief that the universe, in its infinite wisdom, will guide us back to each other. Until then, I carry your essence within me, a steady heartbeat echoing the rhythm of our shared dreams. The days drag on, each one a weary testament to the relentless passage of time, as we wander aimlessly through the labyrinth of our regrets, yearning for a path that might lead us back to the familiarity of our former selves. 
Yet with each hesitant step through this shadowed landscape, it feels as though we only stray further from the radiant light that once bathed our existence in warmth and clarity. We find ourselves adrift in an expansive ocean of solitude, where the waves of nostalgia crash over us relentlessly, their relentless pull dragging us deeper into the unfathomable depths of our despair. Memories, once cherished beacons of joy, now haunt us like spectres in the night, reminding us of what once was and what has been lost. In this interminable journey through the echoing corridors of our remorse, we search for solace amidst the ruins of our hopes and dreams. Every passing moment is a testament to the weight of our longing, each sigh a lament for the innocence we once possessed. The echoes of our laughter, now distant and faint, reverberate through the emptiness that surrounds us, mocking our futile attempts to reclaim what has slipped through our fingers like sand. Yet even amid the darkness that envelops us, there lingers a fragile glimmer of hope, a whisper of possibility that perhaps, in the vast expanse of time and space, there exists a chance for redemption. We cling to this fragile thread of optimism, nurturing it like a delicate flower amidst the barren landscape of our sorrow. As we navigate this maze of introspection and remorse, we strive to make sense of our shattered reflections, piecing together fragments of our shattered past in the hope of forging a path forward. Each stumble, each moment of doubt, serves as a reminder of our shared humanity and the resilience of the human spirit in the face of adversity. And so we press on, guided by the flickering light of hope that refuses to be extinguished. For even in the depths of despair, there exists the possibility of renewal, a chance to emerge from the shadows and into the embrace of a brighter tomorrow. Yet despite the unbearable pain of this separation, there remains a faint hope, a fragile dream of redemption. Perhaps somewhere in the infinite universe, our souls will meet again, freed from the earthly chains that bind us, joining in a blaze of eternity where time no longer holds sway. I dare to hope that in this cosmic dance of intertwined destinies, we will find the peace we have sought so desperately that our broken hearts will heal in the gentle light of rediscovered love, and then perhaps the whisper of our laughter will resound again, dispersing the darkness of our solitude to illuminate our lives with renewed brilliance. Now I find myself alone, a solitary figure navigating the intricate labyrinth of my memories, yearning for even the faintest trace of that elusive happiness from days gone by. In the depths of my solitude, I grasp at fleeting glimpses of what once was, but all that remains are fragments, faded echoes of joy eclipsed by the relentless shadow of melancholy. I recall vividly every burst of laughter, every cherished moment held close to my heart. Yet these memories, once vibrant and alive, now seem to drift like autumn leaves caught in a brisk wind, swirling aimlessly into the vast expanse of oblivion that is the infinite ocean of time. Each memory is a delicate thread woven into the fabric of my existence, each recollection a mosaic piece in the intricate tapestry of my life. Yet, as I wander deeper into the recesses of my mind, these threads seem to fray, their colours muted by the passage of time and the weight of longing. In this contemplative journey through the corridors of my past, I find solace in the beauty of what once was, even as I mourn its passing. The bittersweet symphony of nostalgia plays softly in the background, a poignant reminder of the richness of experience and the inevitability of change. I traverse the labyrinthine pathways of my memories with a mix of reverence and sorrow, pausing to examine each fragment with tender care. Every detail, however small, holds significance, a testament to the complexity of human emotion and the enduring power of cherished moments. As I continue to navigate this maze of remembrance, I am reminded of the resilience of the human spirit, which finds strength in both the joys and sorrows of life's journey. Each memory, though tinged with the ache of loss, serves as a testament to the depth of my capacity to love and to feel. And so I wander on, guided by the flickering light of hope that somewhere amidst the labyrinth I may yet discover a renewed sense of purpose and meaning. For even amidst the shadows of memory, there exists the potential for new beginnings and the promise of unexpected joys yet to unfold. Yet, even amidst the vast sea of forgetfulness that stretches endlessly before me, a faint 
but persistent glow remains, a distant echo reverberating through the corridors of memory, a whisper of what once defined us. The pain of loss may be profound, tearing at the fabric of my being, yet it also serves as a testament to the depth of what we once shared, a love so pure, so intense, that its essence lingers despite the passage of time. In the solitude of my reflections, I find myself drawn to those moments of bliss and connection that now seem like distant dreams. Each memory, though tinged with sorrow, holds within it the warmth of our intertwined hearts and the laughter that echoed through our shared moments. Perhaps amidst the gentle caress of the wind or the ethereal twinkle of a solitary star, I may glimpse a fleeting fragment of that past happiness, a tender reminder of the love that once illuminated our lives. These moments become a sanctuary, a refuge where nostalgia intertwines with gratitude for the beauty we once knew. I traverse this landscape of remembrance with a heart heavy yet hopeful, knowing that within the labyrinth of my memories lies the resilience of our bond and the enduring strength of our connection. Each recollection, however fleeting, serves as a testament to the richness of our journey together, a tapestry woven with threads of joy, sorrow, and everything in between. As I navigate this sea of emotions, I am reminded of the intricate dance of life, where moments of loss and longing coexist with the promise of healing and renewal. Through the lens of memory, I embrace the complexity of human experience, finding solace in the knowledge that our love, though changed, remains an indelible part of who I am. And so I continue to seek solace in the gentle echoes of our shared past, embracing them as tokens of a love that transcends time and distance. In the quiet moments of reflection, I am grateful for the privilege of having known such depth of feeling, even as I yearn for its return. In this journey through the shadows of memory, I hold on to the belief that somewhere, amidst the ebb and flow of life's currents, there exists the possibility of rediscovery, a chance to reclaim fragments of happiness and weave them into a new tapestry of hope and possibility. The perfect world, God of lost souls, you who are lost among the gods, hear me. I live among a race of perfect men, I the most imperfect of men, I a human chaos, a nebula of confused elements. I wander among perfectly completed worlds, among peoples governed by well-crafted laws and obeying a pure order, whose thoughts are catalogued, whose dreams are ordered, and whose visions are recorded. Their virtues, O oh God, are measured. Their sins are carefully calculated by their weight, and even the countless acts that occur in the nebulous twilight of what is neither sin nor virtue are recorded and catalogued. In this world, nights and days are appropriately divided into seasons of behavior and governed by rules of impeccable accuracy. Eating, drinking, sleeping, covering one's own nudity, then getting tired, all in its time, working, playing, singing, dancing, then being calm when the hour comes, thinking this, feeling that, then ceasing to think and feel when a certain star rises on the horizon, stealing from the neighbor with a smile, giving gifts with charming grace, praising cautiously, accusing carefully, destroying a soul with a word, burning a body with breath, then washing hands once the day's work is done, loving according to established order, having fun to the best of oneself in a certain prefabricated manner, worshipping gods with appropriate decorum, intriguing and deceiving demons skillfully, then forgetting everything as if memory were dead, imagining with a determined motive, projecting with consideration, being gently happy, suffering with nobility, then emptying the cup so that tomorrow we can fill it again. All these things, O oh God, are conceived with clear vision, born with firm intention, maintained with care and precision, governed by rules and reason, and then they are slain and buried according to the prescribed method. Even their silent graves lying deep in the human soul, each has its mark and number, becoming a perfect world of wonders, the ripest fruit of God's garden, and the guiding thought of the universe. In the intricate tapestry of existence, each creation unfolds with purpose and meaning, woven into the fabric of cosmic design, from the shimmering stars that dance in celestial ballets to the delicate petals of a flower unfolding under the sun's caress, every element follows its ordained path. The laws of nature, steadfast and unwavering, orchestrate the symphony of life, ensuring harmony amidst the chaos. 
These creations, whether tangible or ephemeral, bear the imprint of divine craftsmanship. They embody the essence of God's wisdom and creativity, each a testament to the boundless potential of creation. Within the depths of the human soul, these wonders find their resting place, leaving an indelible mark upon the consciousness of humanity. Yet as marvels of existence, they are not eternal. Like fleeting sparks in the grand cosmic fire, they fulfill their purpose, then return to the embrace of the universe. Their silent graves, though unseen by mortal eyes, resonate with the echoes of their existence, each contributing to the intricate web of life's tapestry. Thus, in contemplating these marvels, we glimpse the profound beauty of God's creation. They are not merely objects of admiration, but vessels of profound meaning and purpose. Through them, we perceive the guiding thought that shapes the cosmos, the underlying order that governs all existence. In this perfect world of wonders, where every atom hums with divine intention, we find solace and inspiration. For within these creations lies the reflection of God's infinite love and boundless creativity, forever guiding and sustaining the universe in its eternal dance. But tell me, O oh God, why must I be here? I seed of unsatisfied passion, mad storm that does not heed east or west, dissy fragment of a planet that perished in flamies. Why am I here, O oh God of lost souls, tell me, you who are lost among the other gods? In the caverns of my mind echoes reverberate of forgotten ages and ancient pacts. The weight of existence presses upon me like a burden too heavy to bear alone. Amidst the swirling cosmos, where stars are born and die in the blink of cosmic time, I find myself adrift, a solitary seeker of truth in a sea of illusions. Each moment stretches into eternity, each breath a reminder of the fleeting nature of mortal life. Yet, amidst the chaos and uncertainty, there lies a whisper of hope, a glimmer of purpose that eludes my grasp. O God of lost souls, amidst the celestial dance of galaxies and the silent whispers of nebulae, guide me. Illuminate the path obscured by shadows, reveal the secrets hidden within the depths of my being. For I am but a traveller in this vast expanse, seeking solace in the embrace of cosmic mysteries and the wisdom of ages past. Grant me clarity, O divine wanderer, that I may unravel the threads of destiny woven into the fabric of existence. Let me understand my place in this cosmic tapestry, a humble thread intertwined with the grand design of creation. And in the stillness of contemplation, may I find peace amidst the tumultuous currents of life's endless journey. For in the depths of my questioning, in the yearning of my soul, I seek not just answers, but understanding. Why am I here, O God? Amidst the ebb and flow of celestial tides, amidst the dance of planets and the chorus of stars, grant me the wisdom to comprehend the purpose that eludes my grasp.